Okay, so this is the plan. It's a kind of ambitious. So I will start with projective space, trying to show you what we want to generalize. And then uh, and I will get to the definition of a toric variety. Then I will start with affine toric varieties, cones and semigroups. And then uh, we'll move to fans. This is a word in English that is hard for me to pronounce because this A is like a fence. I don't know, I cannot pronounce it. <laughs> and then uh, we'll go to projective toric varieties and polytops, devices and line bundles, and just a few words about how to see a toric variety as a quotient as we see projective space. Okay, in projective space, we have two complementary ways of looking at it as a manifold where we patch this open set xi different from zero or as a global quotient. Okay? So the same thing can in some way be done for any toric variety. Okay, it works. So um, for simplicity, we will work over the complex numbers, but many things are also valid in other fields. So what's a torus? A torus is an algebraic group which is isomorphic to C star to the n, and the multiplication is coordinate-wise multiplication. Okay? There is a, this is commutative, associative, and there is a neutral element which is the one, 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 one. Okay? And then <coughs> if we look at the torus, which are the functions on, in the torus, somehow what we are doing is we are, these are where all coordinates are different from zero, so we can either just invert any coordinate or invert them all together and we get isomorphic things. And this is uh, isomorphic to a ring of polynomials in this x's and x's to the minus one, and so this gives a Laurent polynomial ring. So these are some finite sums of polynomials except with finite support, except that the exponents could be integer, uh, negative integers, not necessarily natural numbers. Okay? So this is the torus, and these are the functions on the torus. And something that we will see probably in the next transparency, that this uh, Laurent polynomial ring is what's called the semi-group ring of Z. And there are, we have this, all the monomials, and this is the, the semi-group ring uh, where M is in Zn, and the addition is coordinate-wise, and the multiplication is like this. Uh, Z to the N, thank you. Okay, so let's go one more back to projective space. So projective space is we take C n plus one, we take away the origin, and we have the standard uh, action, which gives us equivalence classes. It's just you know, all points in, on, on a line through the origin are identified. <coughs> and what is the torus of P n? Well, the torus of P n are the points all whose homogeneous coordinates are non-zero. Okay? This is the torus of Pn. So this is the same thing as taking the classes of vectors with all non-zero coordinates. Okay? And if this acts the same way, so this has a multipl coordinate y multiplication, and this goes, back, goes down to projective space. So we get the torus inside projective space of dimension n. And it's easy to see that two points in Pn are in the same orbit if and only if they have the same support. The support is which are the non-zero entries or which are the zero entries. Okay? Two points with zeros exactly the same pairs can be drawn one to the other by an action of the torus. Okay? And then <coughs> the torus itse itself is just one orbit. It's the orbit of the point one, 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 one. Okay? Please stop me if I going a little bit quickly. And then in this section there are n plus one fixed points, which are the points one, zero, 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 etc. All the points which have a non-zero, a single non-zero coordinate. And there are n plus one invariant hyper invariant by this action hypersurfaces, which are the hypersurfaces xi equal to zero. And then we can see it, as I said, as a quotient, but also as the union of these open sets, where we glue, as we all know. Okay? 
And these are also, these open sense are also invariant by the action of these torus. So we will see that more or less this is going to be the general shape of a toric variety. We are going to generalize everything which is in this slide. Okay, okay so the definition. So here I put these words in a purple because these are really not needed, but we will keep it because things are simpler. So we can study non-normal and over other fields, or maybe other things, I don't know. Uh, but the definition is the following. So what's a toric variety? We have a normal algebraic variety, and it has a dense Zariski open set, which is a torus. And this torus has its multiplication, and this sits inside t times x, and there is an action of the torus that extends the action of the torus multiplication. So this is the definition. And the first examples that we have, I showed you Pn, but with the same operation, we have Cn or C star to the n. So for the moment, we, we know all these uh, toric varieties. Let's try to see more. So let me define what's uh, cone uh, dual. So most of the time, I will say cone, but our cones are going to be polyhedral cone, polyhedral and rational cone. What's a cone? <coughs> Sorry. So this is a cone, but this is not the cones we are going to look at. We are better going to look at cones of this shape or this shape. So our cones are going to be so in the plane, it just it's very easy. A cone in the plane is just something like this. Or it could be something like this, but we are not going to consider this. We are going to consider uh, cones such that either the first, in the first, these directions are rational, and we are going to take the first integer ve vector in this direction. So cone is, a, if a point is there, the whole ray is there. We will take the generated rays are going to be uh, rational. We can take the first integer there. And or we can look at the inner normals of these cones, and these are also rational. Okay? So these are bounded by a finite number of uh, high, uh, linear hypersurfaces. OK, so we start with two lattices. At, at the beginning, I would put some colors, and then I couldn't end putting colors. But in the first slides, n is the n and m are two dual lattices. So n, once we choose a basis, n is going to be, the rank is, uh, n is going to be like Zn, and m is Zn dual. So it's important to keep, it, to keep track that they are in dual vector spaces, okay? This m is the home nz, okay? It's the dual lattice. So this is like isomorphic, isomorphic to z to the n once we choose a basis. And then, because we are talking uh, finitely generated, uh, free uh, abelian groups, and this, then we are calling to call nr is the associated vector space. If we start with Zn, this is just r to the n. And then we are going to pick a rational, I didn't put it, but it's a polyhedral cone. Uh, our cones are going to lie in, in this vector space. And then once we have a cone, there is a dual cone, which is also polyhedral and rational, which is defined at all the m's, so this is the linear form, this is in the dual space, all the m's whose inner product with all the points in sigma is non-negative. So for instance, if, if this is sigma, this is sigma dual, and if this is sigma, this is sigma dual, because sigma dual dual gives back sigma. Okay, it's an involution. So here, in this case, sigma is the cone, so cone means that w these are all the points which are written as a non-negative real number times this vector plus a non-negative real number times this vector. Okay? Are, or linear combinations, real linear combinations with non-negative coefficients. This is, this is cone. So this is sigma. This is, this is E2 and this is 2 minus 1. 
And then to the dual, I have the perpendicular directions. This is perpendicular to this, and this to that, and I have this, this, this uh, violet cone there. A cone could also be just the real axis in the two plane. Uh, if we take the real axis, then the dual cone is going to be this. All the points with positive on the M's, so that M1 is not negative, so we get a half space. And in fact, it's easy to see. So what strictly convex means that the cone does not contain any linear space of dimension greater or equal than one. So the only linear space that it contains is the origin. So this is not strongly convex because it contains this line. Okay? We are going to take cones which are strictly convex. And then it's easy to see that if a cone is strictly convex, this happens if and only if the dual cone is full dimensional. Look here, if we start, if we take sigma, sigma this half space, then sigma dual would be just the positive uh, axis. So we have dimensions smaller than the maximum. OK, these are cones. Then given n, <coughs> we define the torus, which is just the tensor product over z with c star. So this is once, as a, again, as once we choose a basis for n, this is like c star to the n. And its coordinate ring is what we said, the semigroup algebra, this one that I had in that uh, blackboard. And then, and we have a rational polyhedral cone. What we're going to do, let me... So we have a rational polyhedral cone, and what we are going to do, we take the lattice points here, etc., and we are going to take the semigroup ring generated by all the lattice points in the cone. So I start with the cone, I start with sigma, then I take the dual, I intersect the dual with the dual lattice. And this is a semigroup, and by a Theorem by Gordon, it's finitely generated. And then we take the semigroup ring, this one. This has the name S sigma there, I think. And then the toric variety are the points for which these are the functions. Okay? All the points where these functions make sense. So this is said that the X sigma is spec of that, of that ring. Okay? Then it is easy to see that what we get is a normal toric variety with torus uh, Tn, the one which is there, because you know this is contained in M, so the semigroup ring is contained here, and so there is a reverse inclusion of the varieties. Okay? So this containment gives the containment of the torus inside uh, X sigma. And also, all affine normal toric varieties come this way, are associated to a cone. And I will give you a very rough idea of why this is so. Okay, okay so we know all affine toric varieties. But, but what do we know? Okay, so we have the following. Let me write down the notation again. So we have n, which is like Zn, m, which is the dual. So I will use this new for the dual to, to avoid confusion with the this one which is greater or equal than zero. And then Tn is this, C of M is this, sigma is contained always in Rn, which is associated to N. This is in the dual space. And this is all the things that I've just tried to define for you. And uh, this is again what I just said. This inclusion gives uh, this inclusion at the level of varieties. And then it is not difficult to see that the C point of X sigma, the points of X sigma with values in C are just given by semigroup morphisms from S sigma to C. So which is the operation in S, S sigma is addition. And the operation in C is coordinate-wise uh, multiplication. Oh, sorry, in C is the multiplication. C. And what happens that these are the points of X sigma and which are which is the torus, the torus are those semigroups with values in C star. This is the torus which is inside uh, X sigma. 
Okay? And <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and there is a distinguished point which is the point is the point zero. What does it mean that we have the point zero? If we have the point zero, if we evaluate at zero any monomial which is not equal to one, we get zero. If we evaluate at zero, one, we get one. Okay? And one is like the monomial x to the zero. This is why this zero is, it will send as a semi-group morphemes, it will send zero to one and all other non-zero points to zero. Because we are evaluating like x to the m uh, at zero. So we get zero if m is non-zero and one if it is. Okay, this is the distinguished point. And this point is invariant by the torus action. Okay. This is the point with smallest support. And then there's a definition of when a cone is smooth. A cone is smooth if, so I, I erase my picture, but what happens, it is smooth if we can take the generators of the rays and they can be extended to a basis of Zn. For instance, in, in the plane, any cone is like this, like this one, so I have two, two generators, V1, V2. When is this smooth? Exactly when the, this is smooth? Sorry? V1 and V2 are integer. This is a rational polyhedral cone. And we I take the first integer vectors in each direction, okay? And then it's smooth means that the absolute value of the determinant of the matrix V1, V2 is one. This means that this is a basis of Z2. I don't have to extend, I already have two, okay? And any one-dimensional ray is simplicial, sorry, is smooth. But if in this picture that I had in 3D, where there were four rays, it's impossible that four directions are part of a basis of Z3, okay? So this is less than smooth. It's not even simplicial, which I'm going to define further, okay? So for a cone to be smooth, it, need, it needs to, the, the needs to have generators that can be extended to a basis of uh, Zn. And what happens is that this is exactly the condition for X sigma to be smooth. Okay? X sigma, this affine toric variety is smooth if and only if the cone is smooth with this definition. And this means that essentially up to this, up to a linear map given by this matrix, we have just the first order, okay? And the toric variety is like C2. Okay. Here I put some uh, examples of smooth toric varieties. So is sigma is the first order, so it's the positive, non-negative combination of the vectors E1 up to E, A, E, I are the coordinate vectors. Then the dual is again the first orthon, but in the dual space. Okay? If I start with the first orthon, the dual is again the first orthon in the dual space. And then it's easy to see that the associated toric variety is isomorphic to Cn. And then if sigma is just the origin, just zero is a code. Okay? If we start with zero, then the dual is the whole space Rn. We intersect with Zn, we get Zn. And so we get all the monomials, and then the x sigma is just the torus. Okay? It, so we can have, sigma could have any dimension you like, and we are still going to get a variety of dimension m, because this is lying inside Rn. Okay? And the duals we take in Rn dual. And then if sigma is this ray, the, here the pictures are superposed, but this ray is. is this ray and this picture in dual spaces. But if sigma is this ray, 
Then x sigma is the following. So all this violet part is, is the cone. So s sigma are all the monomials here. All the monomials here means that I can allow any value I can allow that x1 takes any value, but x2 has to be non-zero because I, can, I should be able to raise it to positive and negative powers. So what we get is c times c star. So this is a spec. This is spec of this semigroup, of the integer points on this side. Okay? And then this definition is simplicial, which is a little bit less than smooth. Simplicial means that the, it, ca it can be generated by linearly independent vectors. So in the plane, any cone of dimension 2 is simplicial, but it's going to be smooth only when this is 1, but always simplicial. But in dimension 3, this is not simplicial. I need only three generators to have something simplicial. Okay? In dimension n, I need n generators if it's full dimensional. And what happens is that the Cone is simplicial if and only if the toric variety is orbifold. In fact, locally is the quotient by a finite small abelian group. We'll see a simple example of this. So this determinant being non-zero gives a small a group of uh, order this determinant was going to act and produce a singularity. And then this is such an example, the one that we <coughs> had before. Here the determinant is equal to 2. So this is simplicial but not smooth. This is S sigma. So it, it is not so clear, but I have this point and this point. But this point here cannot be obtained as a post combination with natural number coefficients of these two. So the first one that I get is twice this point, because just the determinant is 2. So this point is one half of this plus one half of this, but I need it to generate the semigroup. So this semigroup has three generators, this one, this one, and this one, which are this one here. And this one, we're going to use this, is the middle point between these other two. Okay? So if I put here any three, so this one is the middle point, I'm going to get an isomorphic uh, variety. So what happens to this variety? So if I need to take the semigroup ring, I need three generators. I, get, I need 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 2. This means that this C of x, xy, xy squared, and there is an obvious equation that means this square equals this and this, which comes from the fact that this point is half this plus this. Okay, this, the, the linear relations among our points give us the equations. This is a very general feature. Okay? So this can be presented this way. So a concrete way of seeing this toric, the associated toric variety is this zero set, which is easy to be singular at the origin. And in fact, it's, it is isomorphic to C2 modulo the action of uh, Z2. Z2, this two is uh, the determinant, sorry, the determinant is here. And the action is we, mat we identify the point x, y with minus x, minus y. So if we do that, which are the invariants of this action? Well, the invariants of these actions are generated by x squared, x times y, and y. So x and y have no meaning, but each time I take either x squared or y squared of x and y, this has a meaning. This generate, these three monomials generate the invariance by this action. And so, again, what we're going to get, and this squared equals this and this. So this, if we work this out, this says that this variety is equal to C2 modulo this action, which gives us a singularity at the origin, OK? Sorry. So here is our friend, the uh, non simplicial cone. I need four generators, which are these ones here. And then this, the semigroup ring is generated by these four monomials. And again, looking at the relations, I think uh, this plus this equals this plus that. 
From this, we get that the equation is xz mi uh, sorry, minus yw. Sorry, this is the w. Uh, here, I corrected here. So we see this is a, a concrete incarnation of the tonic variety, and it's easy to be that it is singular. It's not an orbital. The singularities are worse, okay? Because this is non-simplish. Okay, now let's move to fans. I will do my best to pronounce fans. So what we have is not just one cone, but a collection of cones, a finite collection of rational polyhedral cones. And what we are going to, strictly convex, and we are going to ask that each time two of them intersect, there is not an overlapping of the interiors. They intersect in, at the cone. So what is the phase of a cone? We have this cone. How many phases has this cone? So a phase of a polyhedral object it's just the intersection of any linear space with, the, with my convex object, okay? So the intersection, so if I come in this direction, I will hit at the origin, so this is a phase. If I come just in this direction, I will hit here, so this, each of the rays is a phase. If I come in this direction, I will here, there are three dimensional phases and there is one two dimensional phase, so this has one two-dimensional phase, three, uh, one, three, see, here it is, okay. Three two-dimensional, three rays, and the origin, and one zero-dimensional phase, okay. So what we ask is that we cannot have an overlapping like this if they, if this is one cone and this is the other one, the intersection has to be either this or the cone can be on this side and intersect here. So the intersection of two of the cones has to be a phase of both could be of any dimension, okay? just the origin or bigger dimension. And we also add to the collection all the faces, which are again uh, strictly convex rational polyhedral cones. So we, put, we pick a collection of cones that intersect in common faces and add all the faces of these cones, and this is a fan. And then we can glue, so what we were doing up to now, so I was explaining how to get the tonic variety out of this and out of this. In fact, I didn't tell you. So I explained to you that we can also get the tonic variety out of the origin, which is going to be the torus in the tonic variety associated to this sigma. But also I have these sigmas, these have these other two faces, F1 and F2, and each of the faces is itself a cone, and this face is going to give a tonic variety which as well as the torus, the torus sits inside X sigma as an open then set, and each of the tonic varieties associated, associated to the faces also gives give open sets inside our tonic variety. The way of getting from this variety to this is by inverting something. Okay? We'll, we'll go back to this. So this, uh, the, the coordinate ring comes just by localizing. So, um, so we're going to do is very quickly, because I'm not going to be very precise on this, is we are going, we are, we'll construct a toric variety associated to such a fan, and we are going to glue them. Uh, and each of them, each x sigma is going to be an invariant open set. Okay, as I said, or maybe I didn't, there is a torus orbit associated to each cone, and the, the dimension of the torus orbit is complementary. So the zero has dimension zero, and the torus orbit is a full dimensional Sarinsky open set. But in general, if it dimension one, so we start with the cone of dimension one, we're going to get a hypersurface, okay? So here for each ray. So there is a notation that I haven't written, but let me write it here. So this sigma is our fan, is our collection of cones. Sometimes I will write this. This will be the one-dimensional cones in the fan, the rays. And sometimes I will write this. These are the full-dimensional cones. So for instance, here in this picture, I have three full-dimensional cones. This would be here. And I have one, two, three, four, five elements here. And sigma is the whole collection. Okay. 
And what happens is that for each ray, there is an invariant divisor, which has covalent relationship divisor, which comes as the closure of the non-closed sources. Because the closed sources are not closed, but the closed them are the end of the I think you have a tick. Does it work? Sorry. <laughs> um, OK. And then, as I said, 0 is a phase. And this is contained. And I'm going to be very quick. But in general, given two cones, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and tau is the, common interse is the intersection, which is the phase of both. In fact, what happened, how do, how do I get a, a phase? I, I get a phase is I intersect with a hyperplane. Okay? This hyperplane has some dimension m. And then it happens that um, if I have a phase, there is a lattice point. The lattice point is a point in m or in zn. It says a lattice point in the dual. Here, the notation is this, but should be dual, such that the phase is the intersection with the orthogonal. And then we glue these two varieties using the fact that the coordinate ring of a star comes from the semigroup where you take the semigroup of sigma 1 and you invert m. Instead of n times m, I allow negative coefficients. And then what happens is that this toric variety is the localization of these two. It's an open set where this is non zero here, here is m, and here is minus m. Okay? I'm not going to say much more how, about how you glue, but it's not so complicated. You have to read, and it can be very concrete. Okay? If you work this out for projective spaces, you get the coordinate changes that you expect, and I will show this. OK, this is what I'm going to show. So we take, how do we construct a projective space? We take, let's say, how you construct P2. So it's usual to make this picture. I take E1, which is 1, 0, E2, which is 0, 1, and E0, which is minus 1, minus 1. And look, it's obvious that the sum is going to be equal to 1. In, and the cones are maximal dimensional cones are this cone, this cone, and this cone. So what's important here is that I need three vectors such that the determinant of any two of them has absolute value equal to 1 and the sum is equal to 0. There's nothing uh, inherent of the fact that I take the first order. I just need three vectors so that each two of them give a basis of C2 and the sum is equal to 0. This is the only thing that matters. Okay? But the standard way is getting the first order. And if we glue, we get projective space. These are the cones. And then, if you follow the, the rules that I try to tell you, we get x0 is spec of xy, x sigma 1 is spec of y, and uh, etc. What is the, I think that the notation is, is it's not the same notation, maybe. And then we get that each of these are precisely the, set, the open set xi different from 0 in. Uh, P2, and we get the usual gluing. You can work it out just writing that this point is minus this. Maybe you, you, you write these spaces in terms of these bases, and this gives you the exponents of the coordinate change. Okay? There is a monomial change of coordinates, and the exponents of the monomial change are read in the way you write the basis of this cone in terms of the basis of this cone. Okay? It's, it's, it's easy to do. Okay. So what's interesting is that there are properties of this toric variety associated to the fan from the fan itself, from the combinatorics of the fan. First thing, being smooth is a local property. So this variety is smooth if and only if uh, this is, you know, it's if and only if uh, each maximal cone is smooth. So each x sigma is smooth. And then it is an or orbifold if and only if each maximal cone is simplicial. Oh, sorry, and it is compact if and only if the union of the cones equals the whole area. Okay, 
but it is not necessarily a projective variety. There are further conditions to get a projective variety. I need that the, uh, that the union of the cones fills the space to have a compact variety. Okay, so let me give you a second example. A second example are here several surfaces that depend on the parameter R, non-negative parameter R. These are ruled toric varieties. And then <coughs> FR, H, HR is the vector bundle associated to, uh, of PN associated to this shift. And it is the toric variety associated to this span. So I take one, zero, zero, one. This is one cone, second, third, and fourth. This is the direction minus one R. It could be when, uh, when, uh, so we'll, when R is zero, we get the vector here. We get this, 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 and this is P1. When R is zero, we get P1. I will maybe come back uh, later. Or maybe we, I can do this now. For the moment, what, what is the only thing that we see about P1? So we can translate the change of coordinates and see that this is the change of coordinates of P1. So I have E1 minus E1. Let's call this E2. Uh, no, this is E2, it is E3. And this is E4, which is minus E2. So which are the, as in the case of projective space, there was essentially one relation is that the sum of E0 plus E1 plus E2 is zero. And from this relation, we will see here there are some hidden numbers that you don't see, which is a one, a one, and a one. This is what gives the grading to homogeneous polynomials in projective space. And here there are two relations. One says, says A1 plus E3 equals zero, and the other says E2 plus E4 equals zero. So here, if you wish, this is one times this plus zero times the other one plus one plus zero. And if you look carefully, this is going to be to give the bi-grading. This gives a bi-grading. We'll, we'll come back to this. Okay, when R is one, uh, we get the blow up of P2 at the origin. And pictorially, well, how do you get the blow up? So if we, if, we if we take this away, we have three vectors that add up to zero. This is again a manifestation of P2, okay? Now I don't have the first order, I have this one, but this is again P2. And when we subdivide the code, this corresponds to a blow up. You can do the math and the computation and it's easy to see. Okay, so we can think that we have this and then adding this ray blows up a point. And in general, it's smooth only in these cases. In general, uh, what we get is a blow up of a weighted projective space that I'm not going to talk about, uh, sorry. But the, the only important thing is that this subdivision is blowing up. So in this picture, if we put another ray, it means another blow up? Yeah. And does it depend on which, po on which se uh, sector you put it? Let's say the, the green one or the blue one? Yes. If you put the pen? In general, the way of uh, desingularizing a toric surface is just subdividing in such a way that then the determinant of two consecutive one is equal to one. This is the way to desingularize the toric surface. In, if you are in higher dimensions, you can subdivide. Sometimes, if you have something which is like a square, you subdivide like this or like this, but sometimes you need to add a ray. But this is, there is a well understood uh, toric desingularization that some other people could explain better than what I can. Okay, some facts. So the, the elements of N give one parameter sub subgroup, so we get a curve for each U here, we get this curve, and it happens that we consider this is a point in the torus, okay? This is a point in the torus, and then we ask when is it that there is a limit in X sigma? Well, this happens if and only if U is in sigma. So this is a way of getting sigma back. Sigma is this cone for which these limits exist. Okay, and what's the torus? 
the torus, uh, no, what's the torus? And if we take u in the relative interior of sigma, the relative interior means that if I have a, um, a ray, it is not in the boundary. So I can have something on the plane in 3D, which is in the interior, if I just look at the, in the interior with respect to the linear space that which is generated by my code. And then if I am the interior, then the limit equals this distinguished point that I mentioned. And in fact, if we think of this carefully, this allows to recover the fun from the variety, just looking at limits as of one parameter subgroups. Okay, and so what happens is that the historic varieties are partial algebraic compactifications of the torus. And so if rho one up to rho r are the rays in the fan, the element of what I call uh, sigma of one, I am assuming that this has cardinality r, I'm taking all the rays. Then the toric variety has this torus, but what else? Well, if I take away the torus, I get a union of toric divisors, of invariant divisors, one for each one of the rays. So for instance, what is C2? It's C star two, and I add two divisors, the one corresponding to this boundaries, boundaries, okay? This is why I get x1 equals zero and x2 equals zero. And it's a way of seeing C2 as a partial compactification of C star two. And it's not complicated to see, but there's also this is only the beginning, that the toric morphisms, the, the equivariant morphisms correspond to um, morphisms of the lattice. So what's, this is, a, um, here should, was supposed to be n prime. So here, the notation is they have one uh, fan in this lattice n and another fan sigma prime in this other lattice n prime, but I missed the prime. And then there is a natural way of saying I have a morphism of lattice, which in such a way that each cone in sigma goes inside some other cone in sigma prime. So this is, uh, this is compatibility with the fans, okay? And the, all toric morphisms come this way. Okay, so let's move to lattice polytopes and projective toric varieties. So what's a lattice polytope? There are two, uh, dual ways of presenting it. Either as a convex hull of finitely many lattice points, so I just pick some points. Lattice points means points in M or in CM. This is the lattice point. I pick some of them, then I take the convex hull. In the plane, I'm going to get the polygon with integer vertices. Or I can think that what I do is the intersection of I, I am almost going to pick the first integer vector in this direction. So in the direction of this has space, with this has space, with this has space, with this one, and with this one. So it's either the intersection of has spaces and it is compact. If we have an intersection of has spaces, this is called a polyhedron. Polyhedron, a cone, the cones that I had were polyhedron, polyhedra. And when, it, when they are compact, they are called polytop, okay? A polytop is a compact intersection of rational half spaces. So I can present it either as a convex hull of finitely many lattice points or as um, the intersection of these half spaces. So I'm going uh, here, I'm calling eta, this point, this is going to be the face cut out by eta. And these are the points these are the x's, so the inner product is plus a, eta is equal to zero. And then we move it to the other side, we call minus a eta. It's convenient because we want to move it here and have a plus, okay? And for any point in my polytope, this is going to be greater or equal than this. This is the min minus this is the minimum value that it takes. So here the inner product maybe is one and here two, three, etc. It grows. Okay, so <coughs> the intersection is a half, is a phase, and we are going to denote it f eta. And once we have a polytope, we can get the normal fan. For instance, if we have this unit triangle. So this is one, zero, zero, one. Then now, this, is, this lies 
in NR, in la MR, in fact. This is in the dual. And then I'm going to draw, this is P, then I'm going to draw a fan, the sigma of P, which is in NR. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take for each phase here, I have the whole thing is a phase. And I have this, I have seven phases here. For each phase, because it's a, it's, it's a place where the zero function gets minimized. Okay? Each phase is where a linear function gets minimized. I can think that this is the phase where zero is minimized. So I have zero. And then I look at all the points where the minimum of, I, I, I start in this direction and I hit this phase. And I start in this direction and hit this phase and hit this phase, what I'm going to get? I'm going to get these three directions. So if I start in this direction, it's going here, there, and there. Okay, these are the three directions in which I'm going to hit each one of the three phases. And what happens if I come here? Any point in the middle, what, which face I'm going to hit? The vertex, okay? If I start here, I get this, here, the, anything in the middle, I'm going to each this vertex. So there the, these are cones of complementary dimension. The whole thing gives a cone of dimension zero. Well, here, one and one, we didn't see because one plus one is two. <laughs> one is two minus one. But we see it here, we have vertices and we have 2D things. Okay? If I start in these open cones, I'm going to hit in a vertex. And so this, the closure, I need to take this, this uh, directions. This, in fact, there is an open cone. I, in order to hit this vertex, I need to be in the open orphan. Okay? So to take the cone, I take the closure. So for each phase, I get a polyhedral, rational, closed cone strictly convex, which are the closure of all the etas, which cut out this phase. And in fact, this coming from P, I have defined a fan, and this fan defines a projective toric variety. I will try to show you in a while how do I get the embedding, the polarization. And for instance, as I draw, the fan from P2 is the normal fan of a simplex. There is something to be said now, okay? Once is I can put this simplex anywhere on the plane. I'm going to get the same drawing. And moreover, I can amplify. So I could have taken D and D. And again, I will get the same fan. So the fan has some information, but not all the information. So I need the polar, different polarization to distinguish between this of size 1 and this of size D. I need the further information. This will give the this uh, Veronese embedding of P2, and this will give just P2. But I cannot, if I start here, I cannot, I will see that there is a way of going from the fan to a polytop when the variety is projective. But we cannot locate where the polytop is, and this translation in definition is going to be contained exactly in the linear equivalence in the toric variety. So linear equivalence is exactly that I get polytops up to any translation, integer translation. Okay, so, so what's a character I didn't mention, but the elements of M are characters. They are, if we are just in the Laurent polynomial, these are monomials x to the n. Okay, so I pick, just think that we have a monomial x to the m. This is a function, a rational function on the torus, so it's also going to give me a rational function in my toric variety. So I would like to, a non-zero rational function. So I would like to see which is its divisor, okay? I have a rational function with, given by any monomial x to the m for any m, which is um, the divisor that we associate. And then it's easy to see a monomial has neither zeros nor poles in the torus. So the divisor has to be with support in these hyperplanes that we put what is called at infinity. It's everything which is outside the torus is called the infinity of the toric variety. It has to be the union, maybe with some coefficients, but it has to involve this 
devices which are at the boundary and which are moreover invariant. So how do I get my divisor? So the, I wrote this, and it happens, it has to be uh, this d row, row it uh, means that we have all the one-dimensional rays, all the rays, the generator of the rays, and here the coefficient in fact is evaluation. So is the, um, it no, is the evaluation associated to the to this ring, but I will not, maybe Marx Vivakovsky uh, talked about valuations, but in this case it's very concrete. The divisor that we get is just here, is the inner product of M, which each of the generators of the race. This is the coefficient of this invariant divisor D row. So this is the divisor of a character, okay? And then let me go back to this blow up story that I tried to tell you. So here I have two maximal dimensional cones. One is this light gray uh, cone and the other one is this one. So U1 is one zero. This is zero one and this is one one, which is written here. So what I have just said is that the divisor of X to the U1 plus the inner product with u1 times d1 plus the inner product with u2 times d2 and then uh, we see that uh, one of the inner products is going to be zero and I get d1 plus d0 the inner product with d2 is zero because these two are perpendicular and I do the same with the other one and I get this again because e1 and e2 are perpendicular and then what's going to happen is that the class group, and this, as I told you, this corresponds to the blow up of zero in C2. You can figure out exactly why this happens. The gluing are exactly the, the change of coordinates that define the blow up. And then uh, it's easy to see that in this case, I have just two divisors, but I will tell you the general statement a while ago. So these are all uh, by the versus modular linear equivalence, this is going to be equivalent to z, and the generators means this, this is linear equivalent to zero, this is the device of a rational function, so this is zero, and the one plus the zero again is zero, so I get that there's one generator, and this happens. Okay? The class of this equals this class equals minus the other. And there is a standard map that goes from the blow up to C2, uh, it's because I just take the identity. So one, one fan is just this cone and the other these two. So if I take the identity, this is clearly a lattice map, and this cone is containing this, and this is containing this, so this is compatible, and this identity map is exactly the blow up when you do the kind of computations. Okay, so let me tell you how do you get the class group of a toric variety. So the action of the torus, I already talked about this, gives a, an action on the right divisors. So it's a, it's a linear combination, finite linear combination of uh, prime divisors with some uh, integer coefficients. And we can move by the torus of the action the divisor, and it is invariant if this. We go back to where we were. And we're going to make this notation for the invariant by divisors. And it happens, I'm not going to prove it, but it's not difficult. This relies on the fact that the torus is affine, nothing happens there. That the invariant, the invariant by divisors are just linear combination of these zeros that come from the one dimensional race in the fan. And then there is an exact sequence. So what's this map? Let me write down this map for you. So if we have a, a chosen basis, this is just this M, which is there, just a ZN. And we go to Z, to the cardinality of sigma of 1. Because this is, these are just, this is, our, um, this is a free module with these generators and these coefficients. So what I have here is isomorphic just to Z to the R. Okay. 
And then here I have the class group. And this map sends M to M, let's say that row R, row R, and the race is the inner product of M with row 1, comma, 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 inner product of M with row 1. This is very concrete. So this, what I have here is a finally generated abelian group, which is the quotient. It might have torsion. Okay? There is a part, the rank is going to be uh, in general. So the question is, when is this injective? This is going to be injective if the race, this is, this is injective if uh, the race generate Rn. If I have race that generate Rn, I have these two independent rays, uh, n independent rays, this map is injective. <coughs> and what we get here are all the invariant devices, all invariant by devices modular. Uh, Linear equivalence. Linear equivalence is being the divisor of a rational of, a, of one of these rational functions x to the n, which are those elements here whose coefficients are exactly this one. Okay, so this is exactly what I'm, there is a subtle thing that any divisor is linearly equivalent to some invariant divisor, which I'm not uh, to, it's related to the fact that at infinity you only have invariant divisors and nothing happens in the doors. And this is what I have just said. And what is interesting from this uh, description is that this object only depends on the rest, not on the combinatorics of the codes. For instance, if I have four rays like this, I could have this cone, or I could have this and this, or cut this way and this and that. I don't know which is the combinatorics of the codes, or I mean I could have either my fan could be just this book without this. So an exercise that you can do, if my cones are just this race but not this open thing here, which is the toric variety that I get? Can you guess? Do it as an exercise. Okay? Which is the toric of the fan is just these two rays and zero, which is the toric variety? You want the answer? No, you, you think of it and you tell me. Um, I could have this, or I could have had this, and in both cases I get the same answer. Okay? This just tells tell me which are the one-dimensional rays. Nothing more than that. Okay, so in the case of PM, there are n plus one rays, which are generated by these vectors, and then this map is goes to Zn to the Zn plus 1, and the quotient is obviously isomorphic to Z. This map is the inner product with E0, E1, Yn. And obviously we have... And then, what gives me this map? This map is given by the linear relations among the these vectors. And as I pointed out, the only essential linear relation is this one. From the fact that this is the only linear relation, this is the degree that we get, just one degree, and this is why we get Z. Okay? So this is uh, a way of getting a well-known fact about the class group of the projective space. Okay. Now, in gen let me show you an example where this group has torsion. Okay? So let's go back to this example that I had. Remember, I had uh, one cone like this, sigma, and then sigma dual was through 1, 0. Here it was 1, 1, but I needed this to generate the same group at 1, 2. This is sigma dual. <coughs> Sorry. The, the sequence that I had before, R is equal to 2, I have only 2 rays. So this is the map from Z2 to Z2, which is the inner product with this vector and this vector. 
And we see immediately if we add them up, we get 2 and 1, which is even. So the image is a Z2, and we're go going to get something non-zero. If we come from here, we're going to get zero, and what, what, whatever doesn't come from here will, will be the sum is going to be odd, and this will be a generator. I'm sorry. So the, this map is we send a1, a2 to the sum one the two. Okay, so this is the class group of this story today. I find to everybody. Okay. And then let's move towards a Cartier divisor. So a Cartier divisor, I'm going to add a C to the notation. So Cartier divisor as those are locally are given as the divisor of the function. And so Uh, if we take this divisor associated to our characters x to the n, it's easy to see that they are come from a function, from a function x to the n. And so, in fact, this state map that I have here also lands inside the Cartier divisors, in fact, in various Cartier divisors. And the quotient is the Pythagoras. Mm? So I get Cartier divisors modular linear equivalents. So the image are those that are linear equivalent to zero. And then again, the first morphism and the second, uh, the first morphism, morphism is this one, and uh, which is an interpretation of this mapping because the, the the way we write these are in terms of these coefficients that are there. And sorry, and again, if a uh, notary factors means the following. When it is not true that the rays generate uh, Rn, it can be seen that the toric variety is a product of two toric varieties, one of them is a torus. Okay. If there is no torus factor, it's the same thing as say that the rays generate uh, Rn. And we get this other exact sequence, another presentation of the peak. In a, if we have at least one core maximal dimension, this is uh, torsion free. If, uh, this is different from the class one. So they are I will compare the two sequences in a while. So in any affine toric variety, it's not difficult to see that the Picard group of x sigma is zero, it's affine. And then, when is it an invariant device on Cartier? It's if and only if, for any cone sigma, there is a lattice point such, such that the restriction of d to x sigma is the divisor of this character to x sigma. Okay. okay. And this m sigma is, is unique modulo the intersection with sigma dual. This is easy to see. And uh, when we, there is a natural compatibility, if we have a phase of sigma, then we can just restrict the divisor to sigma on to x tau, sorry, or first to x sigma and then further restrict, and this is compatible. And then we get a pole set. Uh, for each phase, we have these devices and their glue, and we have a pole set, so it's a partially ordered set, given by the, this, this relation means this is a phase of this one. And so in fact what happens is that we and there is this, this natural restriction mass that I'm not writing, this form an inverse system, and this is equivalent to this inverse limit. Let me wrap this up for you. Okay? What is, what's the meaning of this thing saying that this Cartier invariant devices are this inverse limit? This means that I need one point, one lattice point for each cone, and this is just to keep it unique, and there is a natural compatibility. The one that holds for sigma also holds for all the phases of sigma. This is the only thing that this is said. Okay, so let me be more precise. So given an invariant Cartier divisor to any cone, we got an associated lattice point, m sigma, which is unique, uh, unique modulo m sigma. So for maximal dimensional cones, it is unique because it's determined by the inner product of the rays, and these are already as many as linearly independent as the dimension of the space, so I get uh, uniqueness. And 
we get the linear function on the cone, which is defined by the inner product with this m sigma. So in each cone, I have this m sigma, and then I have this linear function, and it takes the value of minus a rho for any a rho in the cone. And this defines a vinyl divisor, which is for each divisor associated to the ray, I take the minimum value. This ray could be in different cones, but this compatibility means that it doesn't matter okay. which cone I think of it. There is a fixed m sigma, so there is a fixed uh, value. And then, if you think a little bit, I will make this very concrete, I hope. Uh, we can identify a Cartier divisor with a piecewise linear integer mix that is in each piece is the linear function given by inner product with an integer vector. So for each core, I have a linear function which is a which I'm calling here an inter linear integer function. It's piecewise linear because I might have different linear functions on different cones, but they agree in the intersection in the common faces. So I have my fan. In each fan, I have a linear function given by an integer vector, and they coincide in the common faces. This information is the same thing as the previous inverse limit, and this is all the information that builds an um, invariant Cartier device. And this uh, psi is called a support function. And in the set of such functions is a bijection with a uh, a Cartier device in our variety. And now I have to go on. I hope you still survive because there are lots of notation, and, but I wanted to say something. And uh, you might, you will probably hear more about this in uh, Jose Burgos' course. So when you see it again, it's, ah, I heard something before. Okay, so given an invariant Cartier device, so as I said, for any cone, there is an associated lattice point M sigma, which is, I'm repeating what was already there. And then I take the linear function defined by this inner product. Uh, no, this is just, I didn't shift, okay. So now we take a device of lies. Peak is the, just the, the quotient of uh, invariant Cartier devices modular linear equivalence. That the difference is the device of one of these rational functions x to the n that I had. Then this, you can skip this line, but this means that each, each of these, t has an associated shift, which is in fact the shift of section of a line bundle. So understanding this d allows you to understand all line bundles uh, in the toric paradigm. So there is a, the line bundles, each of them are associated to some one of those that come from one of these devices. And the line bundles are isomorphic if and only D and D prime come from uh, the, are the same element in big. So let, let me move on. So now I start with a wild diverso, which has some linear combination of these D rows with some integer conditions. To such a device, I'm going to associate a polyhedron that in some cases is going to be a polytope. And in some cases, it's going to be a lattice polytope. A lattice polytope means that the vertices are integer. We can cut out something by rational hyperplanes, but maybe when I cut, the vertex is not integer. Okay? If this might happen or not, the vertices could be integer or not. Okay? So I start with D, and then with this information of this integer number for each of these devices, which are associated for each of the cones. I build this, I define this object, I take all the elements in our dual project, uh, dual uh, RM, which are in the intersection of the corresponding half spaces cut out by these uh, linear inequalities. And what happens, main result here, is we have an invariant divisor. In fact, the sections of the corresponding line bundle of this, the sections of the associated shift in x sigma are in correspondence with the lattice points inside the polygon. So I, I, I have this a row, those are, let me make a small drawing. In 
Jo ja. So I have this eta row. Okay? So I start moving it and I place it when I say x eta row equal to minus a row. And then I look at this half space. So I start, I shift it up to here, and I start in another direction, I shift it up to here, and I start moving my hyperplane so that the etas are the direction of the vectors of the rays, and the a rows takes you how to move it, where to place them. Okay? When I once I have this is fixed, so I got sorry, this were called just row. So I have this direction of the rays, and then I have to place them. Where do I place them? This is given by this constant part of the linear function. Okay? So in fact, I have this collection of, of hyperplanes, and each device will tell me how to shift them, where to translate them, and then I look at the interior of the open half spaces. This could be empty. This could be um, infinite, uh, non-compact. Or it could be compact, and moreover, the vertices could be integer points. But this depends. Okay. And what this says, if I take this polygon, or polyhedra, or whatever, if, I mean, if this is empty, this means that there are no sections except for the zero section. Okay. And if this is not empty, the number of lattice points that I have inside are count the dimension of these global sections. So if I want to count the dimension of global sections, I need to count the number of lattice points. Okay? And in particular, if there are five minutes. So when the, the variety is complete or proper, then it's, uh, PD is a polytope, so it's bounded. And so the number of lattice points is finite. So this is a finite dimensional vector space. But trying to understand these dimensions is a fantastic combinatorial game. It's a lot of fun. It's related to what's called Erhard's theory. You start dilating your polytope trying to understand asymptotic uh, behavior of this number of lattice points, and this has been much studied by people in combinatorics. So we have translated counting the dimension of these uh, global sections to count uh, integer points in lattice polytopes. Okay. Now I will start on the other side. So what I try to tell you here. I start with the divisor and I construct this PD. I will now go backwards, or the other way, it's not backwards. I will, I will make an inverse somehow construction. I will start with the lattice polytope. You remember that I tell you if you start with the lattice polytope, there is a way of associating a fan to the lattice polytope. Okay? But the first thing I'm going to do is that I have this lattice polytope, so here should be the intersection. So this is the intersection of these uh, half spaces. So each one for each uh, facet. For, this is enough to put for all the condimension one faces, which are called facets. That those that really you see that bound. And then this is the minimum value. And then as P, I present P as sorry as an intersection of these half faces. And these are the minimum values of this inner product. And then. There is an associated toric variety which is associated to the fan of P, which is a normal fan that I try to describe. And then from P, in this variety, I define an invariant vitalizer, which picks as coefficient these same numbers that describe the polytope. So I have the polytope, the polytope has the direction of the facets and where they are placed. Now I, so I construct the divisor from the polytope. And then what happens is that this device is Cartier, and it's easy to see because of the following. So what does it mean, Cartier? Cartier means that this, somehow that these minimum values that I see come from inner product with something. And it is not difficult to see that they come from inner products with the vertices of the polyta, which I assume to be integer. Okay, so for each of the faces going through a vertex, to know the minimum value, I just need to know which is the vertex. This is where it's going to be minimized. So this m sigma that I had before are just come, come just from the vertices of the lattice polytope. 
And as I said, the vertices give the maximal dimensional points. Okay? And the corresponding integer point is the vertex. And moreover, uh, I'm not going to define very ample. Uh, I haven't defined ample for the moment. Uh, yes, I have talked about what. Uh, I haven't talked about ample. I don't know why I put this. This is ample, and to have it very ample, I need further arithmetic conditions, and this happens if the I dilate. This is also an interesting story in combinatorics and number theory. Uh, here is ample, so I switch this in the wrong way. Uh, ample is if and only if. So I start with P. Okay, let me make a picture for you. I'm not going to define ample, whether you know what it is or you're lost. Right? I cannot define. So assume that I start uh, with this polytope P, which in fact is that is this polytope is such that the associated fan is the, the dose of the that fan of the here set of surface that I because I have this direction, this, this, and this, the directions are precisely this, 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 and this. So this gives the here surface. So if I start this way, so I can start I give you the directions, I can start moving my faces. But for instance, if I uh, move this face, not in the right way, how do I do this? Uh, yes, if I start moving this, this face up to here, if I start moving, I lost this face. Okay? If, if I place this hyperplane, if I start moving, so if I change my coefficient and put it here, what I, yeah, now I'm, so I start with P. Okay, let me, what I do, tell you what I do. I start with P. I consider sigma of P, this gives me a projective toric variety. Now I take a divisor. What's a divisor? A divisor is a sum of combinations of this A row, D row, which in this case, rows here I have row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4. There are four invariant divisors. So I have these four coefficients, and then these coefficients tell me where to displace these four hyperplanes. It might happen that I see the whole picture, or it might happen that I go up to here, I have lost this face. In this case, the divisor associated to such a D is not ample. In order, if I start with P and I go to XP, those divisors which are going to be ample, are those for which the corresponding polytope has the same normal direction as my original P. I have not, have not lost any of those. This is this sentence. It says, let me read it. So an invariant cut divisor D on the tonic variety associated to P is ample if and only if the polytope of this divisor, and this divisor will tell me where to place the hyperplanes, is a lattice polytope, so the vertices are integer, I need them for it to be cut here, and with the same normal fantasy, this is with the same facets. I have lost, I have not lost anything. Okay. Uh, still a short while to go, not much. The last is just fun, so three, four to go. Not so many, so relax, we are going to end. <laughs> so here I put the definition of a convex function. I think you all know, I have a convex set, and a convex function satisfies this inequality, that function in the linear combination is greater or equal than the linear combination of the values. And then, uh, there are some uh, properties of the device that can be read in this support function. In fact, we want to know if the toric device has no baseball, that is, it is generated by global sections, this is equivalent to say that this point M sigma all uh, are in the polytope for each maximal dimensional cone. What was nice is if and only if this piecewise linear function, so I have I have my my polytope and I have this um, this function which gives a linear function for each of the cones. So I, I, I look at the graph of this function, if I get a convex function, 
Then, uh, the Cartier dimension is going to be generated by global sections. And this, let me skip it. Uh, and D is ample if and only if this function is strictly convex. For example, one convex function is a function zero. This is convex, but it is not strictly convex. Strictly convex means that if I have a linear function in this code, in the neighboring code, I have a different maximal dimension. I have a different layer. So each maximal dimensional code has its own linear function, and it varies as I shift from one dimensional code to the other one. Okay, if, I, if there are two, and it's the same m sigma that I take for two uh, full dimensional ones, then it's going not to be strictly complex, and then it's not going to be ample. This will reflect the fact that I'm losing the phase here, the passive here. So I can read properties of the divisor in these support functions. These are just functions on RA, right? And piecewise linear functions on define. Uh, is, you look at the graph about your uh, fan, and you look at this graph, and you can decide the behavior of your device. Okay. Now, uh, I'm about to end. I'll be very quick, but I will try to give you a hint on how to describe any uh, toric variety as a caution, as uh, happens with projective space. So, in fact, I gave you a second example. You remember this example of a core with the terminal 2? That I told you that this was, um, in fact, the quotient of C2 with, by this action which sent xy to minus x minus y. This is another manifestation of showing a variety as a, as a quotient. Okay? So, in fact, there is a description uh, as a categorical quotient, which I will not go into it, but essentially when the variety is simplicial, this is a honest uh, portion. So the total variety is going to be the set of orbits of this action. So what we are going to do is we are going to write this as the, fol the following way. So R is the number of one dimensional rays. And in the case of projective space, there were n plus one dimensional rays, so I have here n plus one. And then I took away the origin. Here we are going to take away something else that comes from the combinatorics of the fan. We're going to take away some coordinate hyperplanes that are uh, defined in terms of the combinatorics of the fan. And then I have to take the quotient by group. And locally, what's going to happen is that our x sigma are going to be the ring of invariance of this action. This is why also I made the word invariant before. Okay, so what I will, I will not say much, but I will tell you which is the g and which is the c very quickly. The good thing about this is that we can work with global coordinates, except that we don't have well, just one degree, we'll have a multi-degree. Okay? The degree is going to take place in this uh, class group, which is this uh, finally generated variable, which might have torsion. So we, we have this sequence, um, this sequence, we are going to assume that there are no torus factor. This is injective, that the rays generate RA. Okay? So this is injective. This is z to the number of one dimensional rays, and this is the quotient. So we take this sequence that we had before and we apply this, and this is going to give us an exact sequence of groups. And G is going to be this group, but this is very concrete because, in fact, this map is very concrete. I show you this map for the PN and I show you this map for this call with the terminal 2. These are concrete maps, so this is a concrete injection. Okay? So this group is contained and is given by some binomial equation. Some products are going to be equal to 1. It, it, it can be made very concrete, but I don't have time to do it. So, but it's very concrete. So I have this G, which is defined like this, and, and so this is the quotient by something, so I have to impose that something that here was uh, sums is going to be products. And then uh, from this, I'm going to write there, so this is like the torus uh, in C to the sigma of 1, so up here, I'm going to, so these R and sigma 1 are the same thing, okay? Except that here I 
or the linear here is going to be without an order. So this object is the torus here. And what is the torus of our variety? The torus of our variety is going to be the quotient of this algebra group by this group. Okay? And we get an isomorphism of algebra groups like this. This is going to be the torus, and this is the G, which is there. And as I said, this only depends on the race of the cone. But so to define Z, I will use the combinatorics of the cones. How do I do that? So, as I said, we have this map, that G is equal to G. I'm going to take away Z that I'm going to define. So this Z is going to be in the complement of the torus. So this will be contained here. So this will contain the torus. I want to take away some coordinate hyperplanes, but this still will contain all the points with non-zero coordinates. And this is going to be our point variety. It will arise as this quotient by this. And how nice is this quotient, this depends. But in general, this is the, the presentation. So what is this z? Okay, so what's the coordinate ring of this variety upstairs? It's a polynomial ring with as many variables as, as rays in my time. And it has a multi gradient, and the multi gradient takes values in this abelian group. So in the case of projective space, there is one rating, which is the sum of the exponents that comes from sum of the EI is equal to zero. Of course, in the case of the other of the variety with determinant two, this multigrading is an element in Z2. It's going to be one, the sum of the coordinates is odd and zero otherwise. And for each sigma, we define a monomial, which is the product of the X row with row not array of sigma. Okay, for instance, in this case, if this is sigma, this will just be the product of, sorry. So I, I'm adding, uh, I'm adding one variable for each ray. So I have three, here, here I have three rays, uh, E1, E2, E0. So I, I take in the variable X1, X2, X0, and I take the product if I take this sigma, all the variables the rays that are not in sigma are just this one. I'm going to take x0. If I do the same for this, I'm going to take uh, this, I'm going to take x1, and this, I'm going to take x2. So in general, I'm going to build a monomial idea that comes, is generated by these monomials. The monomials are taken this way. Each time I have a code, I take the product of the variables, so I have one variable for each ray, I take the product of the variables for the rays that do not lie, which, which are not a ray of my code. And I take the monomial idea generated by all of them, this is C, and C is the variety of this monomial idea. I have to take away, this, this really corresponds to the dimensions that are not going to intersect in my toric variety. So I'm adding to the torus a bunch of toric divisors, some of them will intersect and some will not. If they are not aware, they, they will not intersect. It's, this is related to, to the, how they will intersect in this uh, variety. And uh, there is a description in terms of so-called primitive collections that I'm not going to tell you now because I don't want to go through them. But using this, it's easy to see that this has a uh, condimension at least two. And for projective space, we get exactly uh, what we uh, had from the very beginning. And so and, uh, the group is C star, and the action is D star. And these ones that you see there, there is only one lambda acting because the class group is Z. And, and uh, the, there is these ones that you see there, lambda to the one, lambda to that. This is one, 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 which means that the sum of one times pi is equal to zero. So in general, you would have other integers and it will show up here. And that's all. If you want to, there are many, 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 many books, whatever, not course notes, whatever, Tony varieties, but it's kind of a Bible with 841 pages. It's an IMS, AMS book by uh, David Cox, John Little, and Hal Schenk, and everything is there.
Thank you.